Welcome everyone to this new Europark webinar. Uh, we'll be looking at new ways to finance conservation um, and we'll explore two case studies that look at innovative funding for nature and people. I will be guiding you through this webinar today. My name is Esther Bossing. I'm Europark's communications manager and I'm joining you from Porto in Portugal and I welcome you to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're coming from and your organization just so we can get to know each other a little bit better before we get started of course a few basic webinar rules as you heard on entering this um, zoom room the webinar is being recorded now we warmly invite you to um, start your video we think that makes even a digital environment environment just a little bit more personal and inviting but of course that's completely up to you however um, we would also invite you to yeah make sure that your name is um, accurate and not just um, iphone or something like that so uh, to do that you can just look at yourself or find yourself in the participant list click on the few uh, the three dots next to your name and then rename yourself. Furthermore, um, we are quite a lot of people today, so we will not be opening the uh, microphones. However, of course, we very much welcome you to make any comments or questions, and you can do so by putting them in the Zoom chat box and indicating the speaker that you would like to address. We'll first have our case study presentations, and then afterwards, we'll have time for a Q&A. All presentations and a recording will be made available, uh, both on our website, under the link that you can see here, but also um, by email in uh, for all those that registered at the beginning of next week. So, very briefly, of course, um, I welcome you from the Europark Federation, because we are the organizers of this uh, webinar, and I hope that you already know us. But if you don't, let me just briefly introduce ourselves. We are very proud to call ourselves the largest network of protected areas. We have around 400 members in 40 countries, and I hope that many of you joining us today are our member. If you're not, then I warmly invite you to join us. Um, we're a very fun and open network and we always love to meet uh, new people that's what we're all about actually so um, by becoming a member you also support our work and the things that we do like organizing webinars like these but also conferences seminars uh, representing the interests of protected areas to um, different political institutions and much much more but most of all we're truly a network of people and that's what we do. We connect uh, people and nature across borders. So feel free to check us out. Um, you can also find us on pretty much any social media of your choice. So have a look, uh, click the follow button to make sure that you never miss any exciting opportunity. However, let's move on to what we're here for today. Because um, many of us know the many benefits that parks and protected areas bring to the wider society and the services that they deliver, from fresh water to clean air, uh, places to unwind that are good for our mental health, for our physical health. However, they tend to do these things very quietly. So is there a better way uh, to value the work of parks and protected areas? And is there a way that we can turn this value into financial mechanisms and schemes to actually support our conservation work? To discuss that exactly that topic with me today, I have four great speakers, um, Dr. Hans Kirchmeier, Jana Baumgartner, Phoebe Dunklin and Tim Dagmanton. And they'll be presenting their case studies um, on exactly this topic. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Jana and Hans, and they will um, take us into the world of forest-based payment for ecosystem services um, to offer an alternative income opportunity for forest um, owners and managers. So Jana, uh, Hans, I'll stop sharing and the floor is yours. Um, so we are located here in Austria, south region of Austria near the Italian and Slovenian border. And we are working on nature protection, protected area development since a couple of years. We are a small team here 
working on this issue, but already since 30, almost 30 years now. So thank you all. I just wanted to welcome um, everybody and thank you for showing your interest. I was really astonished by the number of participants that registered for this uh, webinar. Um, just a short information, this webinar is organized as part of the Life Enable project that Europark is leading and uh, to which ECO is a partner. And we were involved in developing a series of webinars, actually. The first one was on use of modern technology in nature conservation management. Then the nature restoration activities and practices. And this webinar is the last one in the series. So yes, the topic as Esther um, um, introduced, it will be about uh, ecosystem services and the payment for ecosystem services. And I want to just give you a short overview on how the ecosystem services are defined and what is the concept of the payment for ecosystem services. And then my, Hans, uh, my colleague Hans will take over and will present in more details the project. So the literature actually offers a variety of um, definitions and classifications. So in simple words, the ecosystem services are the services that are provided by nature. So the ecosystems to satisfy the human needs and welfare. So there must be a benefit and an added value for humans. This means that the ecosystem cannot provide any benefits to people without the presence of people. So this is the human capital here in the graph or their communities. This is the social capital and then their built environment. This is the built capital. Therefore, the ecosystem services should be perceived as a contribution of the natural capital to the human well-being, which forms um, only by interaction between human, social, and built capital. So next slide, please. Um, the ecosystem services are commonly categorized into four main categories. You probably know them all. So this provisioning, such as water or raw materials as timber, uh, regulating uh, climate, uh, for example, or water regulation, supporting where uh, in the nutrition cycling, decomposition of the recycling of nutrition, mainly in soil fertility and ecosystem productivity, and then the cultural services. These are mostly recreation, tourism, and the aesthetic value. So mostly the, the following three categories of ecosystem services uh, uh, is quoted. So this is from the Millennium Eco, uh, Environmental Assessment, then from the economics of the ecosystem and biodiversity. And the mo mostly categorized or cited uh, categorization is from size is the common international classification of ecosystem services. And as you can notice, the categorization is quite similar. The only difference is by size is where they have no supporting services. Next slide, please. Um, the payment for ecosystem services as a concept occurs when the beneficiaries or users of an ecosystem service, they make payments to the providers of this service. So in practice, this may take the form of a series of payments in return for receiving a flow of benefits of ecosystem services. So the basic idea is that whoever provides the service should be paid for doing so. And the welfare contribution of the ecosystem is then quantified and monetarily uh, valued. The valuation of the ecosystem services can occur only in a specific institutional, um, legal, economic, and social context, and is subject to constant social change processes. There are a variety of valuation methods. So there are qualitative, quantitative, which are mostly monetary. And the presentation is in economic units. So for euro, for example, in euros, for um, and this offers easier comparability, comparability of the welfare effects. Um, so just to sure explain this uh, graph, the starting point is where a situation when a land use or a land use practice, so this is this activity A, reduces the provision of environmental services. Um, for example, uh, this is a forest owner where he cuts his forest and where an alternative activity B prevents the loss of environmental services, but implies reduced profits for landowners. So this is the ecosystem providers. 
assuming that the gain in environmental services from switching to activity B exceeds the loss in profits, then the activity B is a socially desirable, of course, then the payment can translate at least part of the social benefits from increased ecosystem services provision into a payment to ecosystem providers. So for example, this is the landowner, so that their total profit from the socially desirable activity can become higher than under the conventional activity. This is this red mark section on the graph that you can see. So this delta or additional amount of the minimum payment plays an important role for the landowners to change from conventional to environmentally friendly activity. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, on the EU level, so there are several established payment schemes. The, there are groups, so in uh, three more or less categories. So first one are the support for payment uh, for ecosystem services that are more public payment schemes. This is, for example, the EU CAP program. This is the, the Common Agriculture Program. There are also Life and Horizon projects where the environmental and the climate actions are financed, including forest conservation and restoration initiatives. The public pay schemes are funded by government agency and are typically part of a broader environmental policies and or conservation programs. The private schemes occur uh, where a company invests in a pay schemes as, par as part of their, for example, corporate social responsibility strategies or in order to meet sustainability targets. For instance, a company might fund a reforestation project to offset its carbon emissions. The voluntary carbon markets allow carbon emitters to offset their emissions by purchasing carbon credits. Um, for now, mostly used are the verified carbon standards and the gold standards. These are the example of private certification schemes that allow companies to purchase carbon credits for, from forest conservation projects. And similar program was developed also by the um, FSC um, as an add-on to the FSC forest uh, management certification program. However, the FSC is not an offsetting scheme because claims are not tradable and can only be used inside a value chain. And another example, which unfortunately is still applicable for France is the, you probably know it, this is the label bar carbon. Um, this is a standard that focuses on certification of a carbon offset projects in afforestation, reforestation, and in cases of conversion from copies to high forest. So the quite new voluntary framework, um, this was, uh, or I don't know if it's officially adopted, but I know that it was pronounced in April this year. It's on, on, on the European level is the um, voluntary framework for certifying permanent carbon removals or the CRCF regulation. And this regulation categorized carbon removals as carbon farming activities. The regulation has a goal of setting up standards for measuring, reporting, and verifying carbon removals. And it can be used, for example, when a regional authority um, needs financing for enlargement of nature parks through the sale of these um, CRCF certified units from carbon farming on voluntary carbon market. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, with this slide, we just wanted to show you a similar example of pay schemes that are currently implemented in Austria and are available for forest owners. So depending on the size, if the forest is small, medium or large, then the owners can use the funds from the forest fund, a so-called forest fund, or the Connect for Bio program, bio program. The duration and the financing is dependent on the size of the forest, of the size of the forest. And another initiative is a more, um, it, when I translate it freely, more virgin forest for Austria or more old growth forest for Austria initiative where anybody can make a contribution to compensate to a forest owner for the income uh, that he or she would otherwise earn by harvesting and selling the wood. So therefore the idea is that through a financial support, the forest will be then left alone for 100 years and allowed to grow independently into a natural ecosystem. 
So this is all from my side. I give the floor now to my colleague Hans and he will continue with the presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jana. So I continue with um, giving some um, thoughts from two case studies we uh, want to present today. One is a project that is has been finalized uh, some years ago and it's the basis for the ongoing project in the Nature Park Eisenwurz in the center of, of Austria. And the, the first example deals with the state forest in Austria, the federal forest enterprise, which manage about 800,000 hectares in total uh, with 500,000 hectares of forest. And the project was had a duration from 2013 to 19, six years. And we, where we have been working on quite a couple of different ecosystem services in total 17 different services. We check the data on the site level, not so for each managing unit on these 500,000 hectares of forestry, we assessed each of these services. And um, the, the main methodological approach was not to zoom up the values um, for each of these management units, but to compare two or three different scenarios, management scenarios to the status quo. So I think that's quite important. And that's what also the um, other schemes are asking for, what is the additional value to the status quo of a changed management approach. And um, we, we tried to develop, or we have developed three scenarios with the managing board of the Austrian Federal Forest Enterprise. So these scenarios are realistic scenarios. They can be implemented. They're not uh, hypothetically, but they, they could be implemented. And the results I'm showing will show the difference between these scenario intensification. So more harvesting will take place, uh, less protected areas, um, more conifers instead of hardwood forest, then there's a scenario ecology and economy. So to make a compromise between the economical interests and the ecological interests. And the third scenario is a extension of nature conservation scenario with more protected areas and less harvested, harvested wood volumes. So about 10% reduction of the of the yield, of the yearly yield. And we applied, um, oh, sorry, different manage, um, valuation schemes. So translating the ecosystem services into euros is a quite complex task, a tricky task and a, a highly debated task, but to make it um, available for, for especially for policymakers or decision makers on the management level, it's still a quite helpful task. So you see there is uh, tools based on market prices, on replacement costs, on willingness to pay, on travel cost approach. Um, so several different approaches. And one important part was the inquiry of visitors in the area to ask them how changes in the landscape are preserved by them and how they would rate it and how they would transfer it into different economic values. And I just um, step through these different pictures. So there had been 1,500 people being asked how you like this landscape and would you be willing to pay more or less for preserving this landscape. So starting with the status quo, this is Selam See in the center of the Alps. We, we showed them different development perspectives like a intensification with more tourism, more, more forest use or a reduced impact system um, with a very radical scenario with very low people and more forest, more nature, but less tourists in this area. And uh, um, the people had the uh, op 
the the possibility to, to choose between different economic feedback for these different scenarios what they would like so there is a clear there was a clear trend to be to pay more for more natural ecosystems but between these previous and the last scheme there was almost no difference so they're not willing to pay for really a lot of nature conservation less people so it's not a linear relation but asymptotic curve and to um, understand the relation between the management activities and the provision of ecosystem services we zoomed up these interrelations so on the left side you see all these factors the management can influence so it's the share of commercial forest to protective forests the amount of the harvest timber the share of roundwood or firewood the tree age at harvesting and so on so there are a lot of things they can influence and they have different positive or negative impact on the different ecosystem services so this is just to show the managers how they influence the provision of different services and we zoomed up the economic values for the three scenarios the orange one is this intensification of forestry the blue one is this compromise ecology and economy and the green one is the extension of nature conservation and the most relevant ecosystem services are lumbering so wood harvesting erosion control carbon storage tourism slash recreation and biodiversity conservation and if you just compare the dimensions of these different bars you see that the first one this is creating real euros in the pocket of the landowner the bars are relatively small so the intensification of the harvesting would create 18, 18 million more income for the federal forest enterprise per year while other services for the social um, community would decrease so erosion control costs for additional measures in erosion control in carbon storage or in recreation or biodiversity conservation there would be additional costs or losses for the for the social for the society and the green scenario shows a loss in the income of the company but for the society quite significant benefits which exceed the loss of the timber income far several times so starting with this input this was um, not very surprising but the dimension was not clear at the beginning of the study um, to, to, to point out the, the, the bars above is what Jana showed this is the income this is the relevant decision making usually for a landowner because that's he makes his income while the other bars are only relevant for society as a whole so it's quite clear that we only can change the decision making for on the land owner if we can compensate and make a transfer from the social benefits to the benefits of the of the land owner and this leads now to the ongoing case study number two we are dealing with um it's oops i have a delay in my slides sorry um so we are dealing with an area of about 50000 hectares of forest in the nature park eisenwurzen it's an area located between different highly protected areas they are world heritage two national parks and a wilderness area and uh, to improve the forest situation there we were looking for different financing instruments and based on the study on the federal forest enterprise we concentrated on just five of the most relevant ecosystem services wood production erosion control carbon storage 
biodiversity and um, the recreational and tourism values. And we are now in a very early phase. We, we had an inquiry on the stakeholders, asking them what is important for you as a local stakeholders, what, what are the most relevant uh, ecosystem services for, for you as people living and, and working there and creating an income. And um, together with the partners in the Slovak and Slovakia and in Slovenia, we had about 70 feedback feedbacks and the, to understand their feedback, we asked them what, what stakeholder group you belonging to. You see that forest and wood industry was well represented. Farmers, not as much as tourism representatives or administrative officers from administrations and, and hunting was well presented in, in the answers. And in the feedback, we asked them to rate the different ecosystem services according to social, ecological, and economic aspects and to rate them separately. And it's not completely surprising that um, from the ecological aspect, biodiversity and carbon sequestration had been rated very high in, in all countries. And the economic aspect is uh, the vice versa. So timber production tourism is rated high. But if we combine the answers of social, ecological, and economic aspect, then biodiversity and carbon is rated high in all of the three countries. And those are two ecosystem services. At the moment, there is no payment for the landowner on these ecosystem services. So the goal of this project is to map the provision of the services on a very detailed level, one to 10,000 that enables us to see who is the landowner providing which ecosystem in which dimension. This is quite tricky and challenging and we are dealing with remote sensing to have very accurate maps because land ownership in this part of Austria is very small. Some owners only own two or three hectares. So we need these very accurate maps. And we working with the nature park to develop realistic scenarios for the forest management in this region. This is an project and uh, that started two years ago already. And we want to develop at least one or two payment for ecosystem services in the field of nature conservation and carbon storage in, in the field of biodiversity protection. So there are public payment schemes already in place. Jana showed you in the slide before to set aside small parts of the ecosystem stem of the forest ecosystem, but what we are focusing now is developing carbon credits uh, on the voluntary market to create a financial flow from the private market to the private landowners uh, and, and not the, the public money, the public funds, but a direct financial support from private people to private people for the carbon storage um, effect of the forest ecosystems. And we are expecting positive biodiversity effects when more carbon, more trees, more old trees are available in the forest ecosystems. So that's in a nutshell from our two projects um, in the Austrian Alps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you, Jana, for this interesting presentation on a very complex topic. Um, there's some questions coming in. Don't worry, we will keep them. However, we will first go to our second case study. Um, if you still have a question, if you are just letting the information sink uh, and some question comes up, don't worry, post them in the chat. Just let us know who, is, who it is directed at. So we're now moving across the pond. Uh, we're going to England. 
to look at strategic nature-based solutions uh, through an innovative financing platform to improve the water quality in Lake Windermere in England. And we're going to listen to a presentation from Tim Dockmenton and Phoebe Dunklin on this topic. So you guys, uh, the floor is yours. What we will do, uh, Phoebe and I, <clears throat> is I'll give an introduction around that, like, maybe a little bit of background, talk about what we do in the Lake Partnership, around managing uh, the place. Give an overview of our partnership actions that are focusing on a project, a partnership called uh, Windermere, and then talk about our partnership. Another partnership with Revere, so it seems like there's a lot of partnerships, but it's a way of like collaborating across the variety of partner networks to achieve our goals in the partnership. And I think going to get into much more detail about the interesting parts around our nature finance plan. So that's what I'll do for the next few minutes and then hand over. So um, just a bit of background. Lake Windermere is the largest lake uh, in England, made in the Ice Age. It's two big basins uh, in there. It's uh, full of natural beauty, a lot of archaeology, cultural heritage. Um, it's got a long uh, period of, of, of human uh, settlement. And as such, in terms of it being a World Heritage Site, the Lake National Park, it makes a really good contribution uh, to that in terms of natural beauty. And also in terms of how it contributed to the other conservation movement, World Heritage Society here, the Lake District is recognised for uh, doing that and inspiring, being the birthplace of the Lake Conservation Movement around, around the world. And you can see on my map there, in blue, the Lake District with its radial uh, lakes, Windermere being the biggest one, and the catchment that we're focusing on and functioning in uh, is shaded uh, in yellow there. It is the best studied lake uh, in the world. For over 75 years, the Freshwater Biological Association has been uh, based on the shores of uh, Windermere, undertaking regular monitoring, sampling, analysis of all sorts of physical and biological uh, parameters um, in the lake. It's not designated as such like a Natura 2000 site, but it is an iconic lake. If you say to people who visit uh, a lake district or friends of mine who live overseas, have you heard of uh, Windermere? Oh, yes, I have, definitely. That's a place I want to go and visit. It's on one of those lists that people, a bucket list that people want to come and visit when they uh, travel, to, uh, travel to England. In terms of that travel, the trains first arrived in uh, 1850, and it was then that uh, visitor numbers started uh, to increase. The romantic movement, I think the Lake District World Heritage Society is known for, encouraged visitation. And uh, that in itself has started to put pressure uh, on the catchment. So for over 150 years, it's been experiencing this increased visitor numbers. That has increased substantially between, for, between um, uh, 19, uh, after 1945, after the National Park uh, was, was designated. And as such, it has great loads of impacts um, on the wildlife and uh, the water quality uh, in the Midwest, where we're trying where, where to address our nature finance platform. Um, our work. These inputs come from sewage, they come from phosphate-based detergents and high visitor numbers. And just to give you a clue about how important Windermere is uh, for visitors in the Lake District, we have, in the last time we counted, um, about 20 million people visit the Lake District and 7 million of those visit the catchment. So we know this from uh, phone data, people visiting uh, the Lake District go there to hub. Because of this and the analysis we've done, you know, the inputs and analysis we've done around where phosphate uh, issues come from and water uh, quality is deteriorating, most of that uh, comes from private septic uh, treatment plants, storm overflows, and septic tanks, and also a significant amount as well from rural and urban land use. And it's the rural and just historic land management that uh, our project is beginning to uh, deal with along with septic tanks. So it's the diffuse phosphate pollution and the point source of phosphate pollution that projects are um, uh, looking at addressing. And around all of that, we know climate change is happening. Over the last 70 years, the lake surface temperature of Windermere has increased um, just, by over one, just by over one degree. So we know that's driving secondary factors uh, in the ecology um, of the lake. All of this leads to quite a complex system uh, to, to manage and to address. So how do we do that? 
Uh, in our partnership plan making, uh, we have a series of outcomes. One of those is our forest nature climate is about integrating all of those challenges we're trying to deal with in this plan, land management, addressing climate change, restoring nature. And there are two components of that in terms of the water quality work uh, that we do. One is around our strategy for improving water quality and resources in next town rivers, groundwaters, uh, and seas. And this fits really well uh, in that. And our partners, our 22 partners around the lake districts are uh, focused on that. And they're focused through it through Love Windermere. So in that outcome for, for nature and climate in our partnership plan, we have set up a partnership with partners to uh, look at addressing that. The Love Windermere programme itself has been operating for the last few years. I just want to make the point that our partnership in Revere, we started that work just before, and I'll come on to how that started uh, in a moment. But I think just illustrating what the Windermere is trying to achieve is important at this point because the effort of work and how integrated our approach is um, across the work that we're doing in Revere and also with our partners um, in the Park Lake District National Park Partnership and in Love Windermere also. So to collaborate, with our partner stakeholders and land managers, we've created a series of work streams in this data science and evidence. That Windermere is a data driven uh, partnership. We have land management, which is the National Park Authority. My colleagues uh, chair that and support that. Uh, non range drainage and wastewater treatment works um, are in our work plans. We have sustainable future finance. This is where we say, well, where do we get the mechanism? How do we get the money into uh, address the water quality issues uh, in, in the lake? And this is principally where our water quality finance platform uh, sits. But it does have a relationship with the data science and evidence in the sense of uh, modeling the data that we've collected and our ground truthing, which we're going to get into more detail soon, and contributing and collaborating with our partners like the Freshwater Biological Association, for example, that I mentioned earlier, um, <clears throat> to achieve uh, all of that. That all feeds into a long term management plan. And at the same time, as well, all the stakeholder engagement and communications that we're out putting out around the beer fits well with um, that work stream uh, in the beer part two. So we have this collaboration across the Lake District, then more focused efforts um, uh, through the wind in there to address water quality at the National Park. In terms of our uh, contribution uh, into that, it's the National Park and Partnership with Revere, we've collaborated with um, Palladium a social impact firm, a national parks partnerships. We've engaged a variety of funds to help us um, deliver our two stages in the first of, of, of our project. Our projects in the first stage, our feasibility study, looked at um, uh, uh, where phosphate is coming from, at first through the catch, but how it might intercept that. Our second phase um, was a design, we've just completed that, so we're now investment ready. The thing that, we recognised before that Windermere started was that there is a water quality issue in uh, the lake. But a few of us got our heads together and said, what can we create with uh, Revere that might address um, uh, this issue? So we approached National Parks Partnerships and Palladium with this uh, proposition, and together we collaborated on creating a water quality pilot platform over the last uh, three years. People are going to get into some detail now uh, about that with a bit of science and background and the work that we've done uh, to do this. Uh, it's worth making note actually that we've been working across other national parks too. So we've been able to work on peak restoration or woodland creation, but we're the only national park in the UK that's got a water quality finance platform that they're, that they're developing. So, Phoebe, um, over to you. Thank you, Tim. Um, so, Sure, if you go over to the next slide now. Uh, so, as Tim mentioned, there is a challenge in Windermere in that the water quality is continuing to get worse, and that's because of uh, phosphorus pollution coming from multiple sources. Um, and the the condition of the lake we're seeing um, at the moment is also being quite heavily impacted by climate change. So, uh, Revere as an organization essentially identifies challenges like this and sees how we can use a blend of public and private payments for environmental outcomes to create long-term natural capital platforms um, that can have a, an impact on the local economy and on the environment. So we saw Windermere as an opportunity uh, to do that, but first we had to understand the scale of the issue. So if you go to the next slide, um, when we first started the project, we partnered with a company called Viridian Logic, who helped us to understand uh, the kind of 
map that we needed to, to focus our attention on. And we looked at the non-utility sources of pollution. And that is because on the utility side, infrastructural changes are required as opposed to nature-based solutions. And because we focused on nature-based solutions, we wanted to ensure we were targeting our attention to the area where we'd have the biggest impact. Um, so the modeling suggested that diffuse sources, that is land use, things like um, agricultural land, heathlands, forests, even urban land, all of this uh, represented about 90% of the phosphorus pollution. Um, Wyndham is also quite unique in that, as we said, in the 18th century, people started moving there. And that means that a lot of the houses were built there with septic tanks. There's about 2000 in the catchment. And that's where about 10% of the point sources uh, phosphorus pollution comes from. So we have a mix of the two that, that we were looking at through our model data. And then in the last year, we also started to do ground truthing. So collecting on the ground data samples. And that's so far provided more evidence to suggest that about 90% of the pollution comes from diffuse sources and 10% from, from point sources. Um, what this has helped us to do, if you go to the next slide, is develop a really targeted suite of interventions. So these uh, riparian woodlands is the woodland along riverbanks. That's the green that you can see. And then the wetland is the blue. And that basically they've been put in really key locations throughout the catchment where we believe uh, they will be the most, the highest impact on phosphorus reduction. It's really important that we make sure these are targeted because as Tim said, uh, Windermere is a world heritage site. So we can't significantly change how Windermere looks through our interventions. So we need to make sure we're identifying the most effective places possible. So 168 hectares of wetland would help to slow down water as it flows throughout the catchment, which gives phosphorus more time to be absorbed into the soil. And it has additional benefits such as uh, biodiversity. In the UK, we have biodiversity net gain. So that means 688 biodiversity units would be generated if we use that code. Um, and then 265 hectares of that riparian woodland would help phosphorus to be drawn down into the soil through the roots. And it also helps to slow the flow of water as well. Um, and in, in addition, we create uh, carbon credits, so approximately 100,000 carbon credits throughout the, the project's lifetime. Um, this, is, this is important for a number of other reasons, which I'll go into a little bit further on. But essentially, this is the map that we're currently working with that we want to, to begin uh, implementing over the next few years um, and that would help us to address this phosphorus challenge. Uh, if you go to the next slide, the, sole, the primary focus for this project was phosphorus pollution but Windermere has a lot of other challenges and a lot of other criteria that we need to meet. So um, as Tim said there's a, a really big local economy there, we've got seven million people visiting a year so we need to ensure that anything we Anything we work on supports that local economy um, and doesn't have a negative impact on it at all. In terms of the World Heritage Site, aesthetically, we can't change how Windermere looks. Um, so we can cover it in woodland or completely change all of the, the arable, not the arable, sorry, the farming land that's used. So there's a lot of sheepland grazing um, and that's part of the iconic landscape that you see. So we need our interventions to work with farming. And that's why we're looking at riparian woodland. So that's woodland along margins of fields instead of in catchment woodland, which would be in the fields themselves. And that would impact both the farming, the local economy and the, the visuals of Windermere. So we need to make sure we're not doing that. And then also permanence. So there's there's a couple of things to go with permanence. Um, the one is that obviously um, we want to make sure that the habitats last for as long as possible. We want them to be permanent land use changes. But also Windermere is a catchment that's quite significantly affected by climate change. Flooding is becoming more and more of an issue. And in a country where we all know it for how much it rains, the Lake District rains more than the rest of the country. So we need to make sure that it can essentially cope with uh, climate resilience. Um, so these are some of the important criteria that we need to consider when we're developing these solutions as well. So while we've created this, this uh, project and we've created this kind of design for a platform that we want to develop. Uh, we're also trying to quantify the additional benefits that we could have. If you go onto the next slide. And this is where the innovation comes in, when it comes to nature finance. So in the UK, uh, the main voluntary carbon, the main voluntary ecosystem markets are carbon. So we have the Woodland Carbon Code, 
and we have the peatland code. And this is a way that you can enable private sector finance to come into natural capital projects. The issue with Windermere is that it focuses much more on water. So we have wetlands that wouldn't apply for the carbon codes that we have. So we need to come up with a way to finance this platform somehow and essentially show the private sector the financial value of investing in something like the Windermere catchment. So we've been looking at the additional benefits that this project would have. Um, natural flood management, I mentioned that uh, flooding is an issue in Windermere. Over the last 20 years, we've had quite a few big floods and these have an impact on the environment, but they also have an impact on local business. Um, there's a train line that is regularly flooded and the trains can't run. There's a road that runs through that supplies Manchester, uh, one of the biggest cities in the UK. And that's also impacted by floods. So there's an issue of natural flood management that we can potentially support through these projects. Climate adaptation, the riparian woodlands will have an impact on the temperature of the rivers that run into the lake. So we can help in that sense. There's a big biodiversity benefit to both woodlands and wetlands. And then there's a whole host of uh, economic benefits as well. So um, our goal for the next few months is essentially to identify ways to show the private sector the financial value of investing in something like Windermere. Um, so we can sell carbon credits through this project and, and carbon plus or nature carbon, that's the, the kind of language that we're seeing around these high integrity carbon credits across the world at the moment. Um, in the UK, the average price of a carbon credit is currently about £25 if we want to fund the Windermere project. It's about 40 years worth of investment because we're ensuring it's also a long-term uh, diversifying income method for farmers so they can use this land as a way to receive income. We'd give them an annual payment for their involvement in the project. Um, so it's about £27 million if we want to pay for the whole thing over that 40 years. So if we want to use just carbon credits, those 100,000, we're looking at a significantly higher amount of money per credit um, than it is currently the market average. And that's because this isn't about carbon. So we haven't prioritized uh, increasing the amount of carbon that we'll get for the woodland or making sure that that covers the wetland payments. So we're now looking at how you can show private companies the value of water and water management. Every company in the world uses water. And if they didn't have access to clean water, a lot of those companies would have to shut down. So we're now trying to sell water quality payments and through our own uh, local system through Windermere to show that um, if you invest in water quality, you're investing financially as well. There's there's a financial benefit to companies too. Um, this is something that we want to start in the Windermere catchment, but we'd love to expand across the UK and, and the rest of the world. We're already speaking to Euro parks at Palladium about how we can use natural capital projects in, in Europe as well. So um, this is kind of the beginning for us where we're looking at how we can be innovative with this financing. And Yana mentioned all of the ecosystem services that exist at the moment um, and the ones that we can actually get money for from an environmental side, I think is really small compared to how many there actually are that would financially benefit the private sector. So if you go to the, the next slide, Tim, um, we're now looking for 35 to, to 40 years of a project. Uh, we're in the site design phase. So this is where we've got our delivery partner who will be going to individual sites, creating these, these unique and very targeted interventions, the woodlands and the wetlands. And then um, we're gonna continue with the ground truth thing. And then we move into delivery and we have 30 years of maintenance from there, which will mean that farmers can diversify their income for that 30 years, they'll receive annual payments. Um, and that ensures that permanence that we were talking about um, because the delivery partners will be working on those sites for the duration of the project. So we're making sure that um, they are already always functioning and will be ground truthing throughout so we can make sure that they are removing phosphorus pollution. Um, and now we're just developing that final business model that will help the private sector to understand how they can contribute in a way that financially benefits them. So um, that's pretty much it as a summary of the, the project so far and our goal for the next few months. Um, so thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Tim. Uh, some questions have already popped it up in the chat, and I'm just um, actually going to start with my own question. I know that's a bit rude, but I want to immediately just jump into what you finished with, Phoebe, because you mentioned that, okay, now you really want to 
um, attract the interest of the um, uh, private sector. So um, do you already have a feeling for how your message is being received? Um, have you found the right language to communicate with them? Because, of course, that's yeah different than yeah. communicating with other stakeholders. Yeah, we are working on it. So part of the latest phase was some research where we interviewed some private sector stakeholders from different industries to understand where their interests were. And at the moment, a lot of companies can see the financial value in carbon. So we're trying to push the, the kind of high integrity carbon message. Um, and then more localized efforts seem to react better to the water quality side. Um, then a more recent market that we've started to see interest in is the insurance sector. And that's because there are financial implications to flooding for the insurance sector. There's a lot of uh, businesses and houses that can't get uh, flood risk insurance because the flood risk is essentially an inevitability where they are. So actually, that's a big opportunity that the insurance sector is missing out on because they won't insure against it. Um, that's something that they're starting to really see the benefit in. Uh, there's also utilities companies that are showing interest. But in, in terms of the kind of scale that we're seeing for carbon, we're not getting the same reception so far. And I think water quality on its own won't do that. But water management as a whole and trying to show the importance of water um, and why we're actually, especially in the UK, I mean, almost all of our rivers are below ecological good standard um, is, is really essential. So yeah it's a it's an ongoing challenge sure sure thank you phoebe um i'll just add on to that actually uh, a, a question from my colleague neil uh, for all of our presenters so uh, feel free to just unmute if you feel like you could answer um it's obviously that these topics are very complex technical topics and uh, both um both of the case studies have indicated working with a large range of, of stakeholders. Um, how do you feel like your work is being received and what communication methods have you seen to be most effective? Shall I answer that? Feel free, Tim. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um, <clears throat> so our initial idea around creating something that will address the water quality issue, um, I will be honest with you, it's quite a difficult one with some colleagues internally, first of all. So that's the first stakeholders we met with our senior colleagues, trying to understand what we're trying to achieve, and then lining that up with a funder, actually, which is Estee Lauder um, companies, about why are they interested, and what have we gone through around uh, checking their integrity for funding and supporting our work. It took a little bit of effort, first of all, just to get their support. But then after that, we could start our work. We started then to uh, engage in our first um, <clears throat> Base of the project with a few local stakeholders, our partners, to talk about what we were doing. Again, there's some skepticism, not quite understanding what we were doing. And the observation that Phoebe and I made partway through our first year of our project was that we're all learning through this. So, as we published and shared with our colleagues and uh, partner organizations our outputs from our modeling, to be prepared then to start to go to other stakeholders in the community. So, we had some evidence based to discuss with them. Um, it was robustly peer reviewed, and that took some quite challenging conversations, you know, around where's your science and data, what were we used, and having um, not difficult conversations, but constructive, but hard, um, in other words. In the end, we got through that phase and uh, had the support. So that initial uh, uh, project role with those partners then turned into our advisory group uh, in the second phase. In between that, we hosted. Um, uh, uh, a workshop at our visitor centre for other partners to come around and learn about what we were doing, inviting other sector uh, representatives um, with our evidence and our information to say, this is what we do, this is what we're interested in doing, and our feasibility is giving us proof of concept and getting feedback. So we're constantly reiterating from the beginning in our first phase of the project, our ideas and our approach. In our second phase, we approached uh, land managers, uh, farmers and, and landowners and agents around what we were trying to achieve. And again, we went through that process of uh, presenting our evidence, iterating our communication style with them. And we just used tools and techniques depending upon who we were talking to. So for land agents, for example, often it was just straightforward, short presentation online or, or in 
their offices, they were competing with uh, landowners. Maybe there was uh, there was um, uh, some, groups, some groups of them coming together because they collaborate and network themselves outside of our way in which we work and talk. So we thought good to bring them together to do that. But particularly with our land managers, the people where, whose land we want to use or ask them to be involved in our, in our work. We, uh, we had some sort of social activity with them in a couple of occasions. So we had evening meetings uh, in the public house. So we had food, beer, sandwiches, things like that, and a good chat. It was interesting, revealing. And uh, we had mixed messages. Some were wanting to get involved straight away, saying, show me the money. We can't do just yet. But how will it work? And lots of questions. And the search that Phoebe talked about, we did with um, buyers and investors and so forth. We did a very similar sort of questioning and trying to understand and writing this out with a variety of those stakeholders and talking about. In the end, it culminated after going through a situation process with a, uh, a landowner and manager stakeholder workshop in May, where we had over 10% of those catchments, uh, farmers and landowners attend, spend the evening with us, and all of them at the end were committing to wanting to be involved in our third stage, the delivery stage that we've concluded the slides on, um, which is really positive and encouraging for us because. We've had to get through, but I think a bit of resistance, but a bit of understanding and learning has been, we have to do that to ourselves. And reflecting that back to our stakeholders, I think one of the key tools we use to help them understand that the tension we were feeling around what we were trying to achieve is perfectly natural. And we've now got a really supportive group of stakeholders, both uh, with our partners and, both, and, our, and with land managers um, as well. Thank you, Tim. Um, maybe if I can add a question onto that, and that is actually directed at Hans and Jana. Um, and it comes from Tina, because she, um, you guys also mentioned the survey that you have of the stakeholders in the case study too. And um, there was a very low response to that from farmers. And Tina's asking um, if, yeah, well, pretty much what the reason mm -hmm. for that is, is, is are farmers not as involved as other type of stakeholders or okay yeah i so our target group was mainly the decision makers in the in the forest so um the the um, the ownership in this area is half large scale owners which we invited to the discussion and small scale owners and we were not focusing on farming uh, on, on grassland or agricultural land because we addressing our payment schemes especially for the forest that's why it's not a lot of farmers in this group but for the small scale um, farmers i think th there is uh, maybe not generally but we made the observation that um, it was very helpful that we had a member from the Chamber of Agriculture supporting the, the payment schemes, the public payment scheme to set aside forests. And that uh, was door opener for many, for many small scale owners. Um, very helpful. So now there's the highest density of uh, stepping stones in forests and set aside forests because it was a person from their side, from the forestry sector, that promoting these, and it was much more successful if somebody from the nature conservation side would promote this initiative. So this was a uh, very helpful that we had this person. So it's sometimes it's just one person that can change things significantly. Absolutely, uh, finding these influencers, so to say, within your community that that are that have the trust from the people that you mm -hmm. want to. Yeah, get on your side, so to say, or discuss with is is essential. Um, there was another question in the chat as well from another one of my colleagues, Sana. Um, it was directed at Tim and Phoebe, but again, I actually also think uh, Jana and Hans, you might have something uh, to say about this. So is there a threat that once private funding can be channeled to protected areas, public funding dries out? And that's, of course, a, a big daunting question. So... Wow. Um, I guess that depends upon political situation and I guess the national financial situation um, as well. I think you may have a view on this, but um, my experience of working in protected landscapes over 20 years is that you go through cycles of government where they're interested and supportive and others when they're not. 
we've seen a reduction in our national park grants. The core funding we get from our government to um, look after what is special about the Lake District. So much so now that our turnover um, is less, so it's more than double what our grant is. So we have a commercial side, an operation, our authority uh, that brings income into uh, support looking after uh, the Lake District. So our national park grant from the government is actually less than half of what we receive. So yeah, there is something around if we're demonstrating our efficacy about, or our, or our um, sorry, is a better word than that, if we're demonstrating our ability to bring money in from the private sector, wherever that might be, grant funding, our commercial operation, private sector finance in the future, is there a case then for government saying, well, actually, you're doing very well by yourself, you can chip away a little bit and save some money and put that money elsewhere, you know, in the government budget. Um, I hope that doesn't happen because national parks, protected landscapes in the UK are there for health and well-being, provide a variety of services for, for society, which is super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think from our side, like you say, Tim, public funding isn't as stable as a 30 plus year private contract. So for us, we think that it's more important to focus on stability when we're looking at uh, long-term platforms like this. And um, there are government grants. There's an England Woodland Creation Offer that we'll use to support with the initial capital works for our woodland platforms in Windermere. But that firstly doesn't cover everything. And um, the Green Finance Institute suggests that there's about a 56 billion pound funding gap between what the government wants to achieve and the money that it's putting in to achieve that. So private finance has to come in regardless. And if it is going to be more stable, I think it's more important to focus on that. And if we can completely reduce our reliance on public funding entirely, anything they provide is just an added benefit as opposed to something that we require. And I think that would be a much better position for us to be in. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, we, we observed the opposite in a nature park, uh, also in a lake, where there was a payment scheme from the local tourism providers from the from the hotels to the land, to the farmers, to keeping the landscape in, in this traditional form. And this was ruined by the public funding scheme, by the national wide funding schemes, which has the significant disadvantage that there is not this local relation between these two players that the, the local farmers and the local tourism providers which are in a dependence so we have this national scheme which does not deal with any needs of the local tourism providers so this was uh, rather the other way around that this private very interesting private scheme was um, replaced by the national funding scheme and on the other way around we need new legal frameworks to create what Jana was showing in her diagram to get more than just a compensation of what you can earn if you do it the traditional way. So in the Austrian situation is that you just can compensate the losses, but you cannot have something attractive on the top to, to, to change it. So for the forest owner, you can earn with the more nature friendly um, management not more than you do today. So why, why changing things what, you, what you're doing? So if we can combine public and private schemes to exceed the loss of income, to make it more attractive to have a nature-friendly management, this would be very attractive, attractive. And sometimes the legal framework is not giving this opportunity to co combining those two funding schemes. Thank you, Hans and uh, Tim and Phoebe for your answers. I think uh, most of the questions from the chat have been answered. I know Hans, you are directly answered Matthias already. So thank you for that. Um, I still have a question actually. Um, it's uh, directed at Tim and Phoebe um, because I'm thinking that there's probably other actions to improve the water quality of the lake happening as well. So how does the platform work in uh, conjunction with those actions? Phoebe may have a view on that. If you're developing the, the, the model and the way it's operating, sure. um, then I think there's something around after the answer to reflect upon when our manager is coming. So especially for Windermere, 
but we try and do this across all of our platforms we recognize the value that the local organizations and individuals are already having and the way they can support us even more so um, we're trying to collaborate with the existing work that's happening at the moment um, in the catchment so I mentioned our delivery partners South Cumbria Rivers Trust are already doing things like reed beds and riparian buffer strips around the catchment and they have a really solid understanding of the work that needs to be done and they have good relationships with a lot of the landowners and land managers there so as our delivery partners will essentially be enhancing the work that they're able to do. Um, we also work with the Lake District Foundation who are getting philanthropic grants in to uh, do uh, social and environmental projects around the catchment. And we're basically supporting each other by promoting each other's work. So I think that for us working with the existing, the existing programs and organizations has definitely supported us a lot. And it's, and it's something that we wanna keep doing. And, um, we're making sure we don't step on toes. There's one particular sub catchment that uh, catchment sensitive farming is a natural England project um, work in more and they also have a flood resilience project there. So until that's finished, we're essentially um, leaving the catchment to them, the sub catchment to them, um, because I think that way there's no mixed messages. And and I, I mean, there are a couple of questions about how to communicate with stakeholders. And I think making it more confusing would, would be a, a real risk if we try to join in already there so um yeah it's something that we're really conscious of and we're tr really trying to make sure that we we work with everyone as much as possible tim mentioned our advisory board as well which is about 10 15 organizations from the catchment all providing us with support so we're being really transparent and open with the work we want to do and and the opportunities to collaborate just kind of appear they yeah there's a lot of work that we're doing together now thanks db i think that aligning what we're doing along with the other uh, key projects so the natural flood management project Farm projects is critical to integrate then a, an approach from the partnership to how we're addressing water quality issues uh, in Windermere. So it won't just be our project that will completely uh, resolve or, or solve the issues around uh, water quality and how we want to improve it. It's a collection, a collaboration across organisations. What needs to happen, I think, you know, as you write and go through our next management planning uh, process, is to have some commitment to persist with that. Because this stuff is going to take decades to shift. We know from previous presentations, it's going to take 30 to 40 years or so, 27 or 30 million pounds maybe. Um, so it's expensive, it's long term. That needs to be recognised in our partner working. So we have commit uh, uh, our intention and just see that through right till the end. Thank you, Tim and Phoebe, for that. Um, I think we have. Time for one final question. One more question popped into the chat from Bernd. Um, and if I understand correctly, Bernd would like to know if there's any alternative funding options um, that were pursued, but then ultimately not so successful or failed. And um, are there any lessons learned from that would be my, my add-on question. If any, Phoebe, feel free. Yeah, we, I mean, as Revere, we, we've tried over the last few years, we've pursued quite a few options and um, it's all, I mean, Revere is essentially a startup. So we all know how many things don't work before you get the, the winning ticket when it comes to a startup. Um, I think there's the biggest issue we're seeing and the reason why a lot of uh, potential payment systems aren't working is, is because of the risk. So we're all working in a relatively new space when we're talking about private finance for uh, the restoration or creation of nature, um, especially for long-term projects and essentially seeing this kind of thing as a payment for a service instead of a philanthropic donation. That's where the kind of shift is really coming in. And because now we're working with private companies that are seeing this as something they will receive a return for, there's perceiving a lot of risk. So. Um, in the UK, you can sell uh, woodland carbon credits up front as pending issuance units. Um, we're asking for people to basically pay before we even have those pending issuance units in some cases. And that means that we really are looking for those very few first movers at the beginning to want to be involved in a project as high risk as this. And that's something that we're currently readjusting our thinking on and looking at how we can use investors to fund the upfront part and then once we get a buyer in that means that we can pay those investors back so that's that's one of the main things i would say we're pivoting our thinking on um and then in terms of windermere itself water quality credits water quality just isn't 
urgent in a lot of people's minds. So that's why we're looking more at water management as a whole now. And, and that's starting to definitely get more traction than, than water quality on its own. Yeah, thanks, Timmy. I, I agree. And I'll just make an observation about, you know, we've got to be agile and revere and um, innovative and just be, I guess, constantly mindful around the bigger political situation or reputational situation for some of these investors as well. There's a big conversation going on around water quality, the state of the nation's rivers um, at the moment, and Windermere is wrapped up in all of that. And one question we're concerned about is, as a private sector investor or buyer of these services, why should I be improving the water quality in Windermere when someone else has caused the problem? That's another part of the storytelling, you know, we've got to get around uh, and, uh, and, and overcome. But with these early doctors like uh, Phoebe is, is, is intimating, we're hoping that with our work, because it's so innovative and novel, that that's the interesting, unique thing that they're willing to support us um, uh, for. Let's see. All learning, all new stuff. Um, that you can come back in a couple of years and uh, let you know how we get on. Yeah, this this is a, a to be continued story yes. for sure because we're very much at the at the beginning of something very exciting. I think so. Um, we will be keeping an eye on on everything that's happening both in Europe and across uh, across the pond, of course. Okay, I think um, with that we've reached the end of our webinar for today. Um, but of course, I already warmly invite you to our next events um, and you can find them all on our event calendar on our website. Our next webinar is happening on the 2nd of July uh, and it will actually be on the management of dead and dying trees um, between safety and ecology. So I'm sure that will be once again an exciting event. Um, furthermore, please save the date because we will also meet on the 7th of November for the first ever Europark eForum uh, and it will we will discuss management effectiveness in protected areas. So as new fin ways of financing is a hot topic, I think management effectiveness um, is right up there as well. So be sure to mark your calendars for that um, and registration to that will open in September. Furthermore, um, please give us your feedback. We are organizing these events for you. Um, so of course we want to make sure that they're fit for purpose and we would love to hear anything, any recommendations, any changes. The survey will literally take you one minute to um, answer and in the end you will benefit from it as much as we do. So um, love to your feedback to that. The link has already been popped into the chat by my colleague Sandra. So thank you Sandra for that. I want to once again really thank our speakers today. Thank you for the engaging um, discussions. Thank you for your presentations. And um, thank you all for attending the webinar today. As I said, I hope to see you again on the 2nd of July. And um, yeah, have a, a lovely Friday afternoon and a great weekend for when it arrives. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.